Hi, I'm Nick from Dorman Products, and today I'm here with Lemmy and Jess, the leader of our electronics development team. And today we're going to talk about the ins and the outs of testing a USB port. So if you're working on a car in 2023, odds are excellent you're going to be playing with some electronics. And one of the ones that we're going to talk about today was actually inspired by a Dorman contributor who brought us a car that was busted up and we thought it would make a perfect case study for talking about USB ports. Before we get into that car though, Jessica, I wanna ask you a little bit about USBs. Can you give us any history about the USB and its place in the automobile and when that sort of showed up? Yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, USB has obviously been around since the 90s and it was first kind of standardized in like the late 90s or early 2000s with USB 1. And it didn't show up in cars until probably about 2006, but mostly like luxury vehicles then. And then a few more years maybe started to be more standardized, 2010, 2012, et cetera, for uh, you know, the lower trim packages. Right. Uh, you fast forward uh, to USB-C, which we're starting to get more and more used to now, started to show up in 2018, and again in luxury packages, and then by 2020, and nowadays, you know, we're starting to see those at all the lower trim levels as well. Yeah, yeah and that kind of tracks, I think, with what we saw. This particular car that came in was a 2016 Avalon. We saw one USB port in there, but, you know, things are a little bit different now. I mean, it's, you know, it's not uncommon at all, to your point, with the lower trim specs, right? Your rental car that's a couple of years old probably has a handful yeah. of USB ports in there. So Nick, let's ask the obvious question here. Why should a tech know how to diag a USB port, right? That's an IT issue. Yeah, obviously new cars have USB ports. All new cars have them. So they're gonna come into the shop and they're gonna want that, these things fixed when they're not working. So a lot of times they're not gonna wanna go to a specialty shop or you know, there's no type of uh, electronics shop that you're gonna go to to bring your vehicle if you have a problem with your USB port. So we gotta really be equipped to be able to handle these type of uh, issues. Right, the car IT department, right. uh, not, not <laughs> somewhere I'm familiar with. Yeah, I think when it comes down to it, right, we're all natively fixers. And if somebody brings you a busted car, it just, you know, you, you want to fix it, regardless of whether right. or not that's a car issue or not. You know, I think you also had made a, a, a good point too at some point, you know, as the car evolved, we got tasked with fixing all sorts of new stuff. Yeah, yeah Nick had said, you know, HVAC systems are a great one, right? Air conditioning for your house is the same as your car. So, you know, every, every mechanic is an HVAC tech, or for instance, you know, your cooling system, right? That's got a lot of plumbing in it. It's, yep. you know, there's, there's a little bit of fixing for everything. And I think, you know, USB ports kind of wind up on the list because as far as the customer is concerned, something on the car doesn't work. And right. it doesn't matter that's an outside part that was purchased, you know, and just bolted onto a car, it, the car doesn't work, yeah. which is exactly what Christina said to us when she brought us this car. Hey, I can't charge my phone, but because it was a, you know, a car issue in her mind, you need to go to a mechanic. Yeah, absolutely. So let me, it looks like you have a nice spread of uh, tools that I've never used before. For me, if I had a USB issue, you know, just being a, you know, old school technician with electronics background, I'm gonna cut, cut open a cable and kind of, uh, you know, ring out the wires, figure out which ones are my positive and negative, test it with a multimeter and see if I got power. But it looks like you have a nice spread of trinkets here that will probably do it a lot easier. Uh, so why don't you give the viewers a little uh, brief description on we each one We can definitely do that. Firstly, I would like you to refer to all of my tools as trinkets yeah. from now on. I really enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, so first I want to point out your way of diagging there perfectly acceptable, right? You don't need to, you know, there's there's always one person who likes to do it the hard way. And <laughs> that's not always you, but- Definitely it, the hard way. Yeah, but that, that, it's probably more difficult than you need to make it. You could totally do that. I would say, you know, you know, breaking out your pins or using a breakout box, whatever, that that, that could be doable. I think it's gonna get really difficult if you're diagging a USB-C problem rather than USB, just right. because they're so flippin' small. You yep. know, they're really itty bitty. 20 pins inside that. Yeah. Plus. There's shielding on the cable you're gonna have to deal with yep. that uh, conveys a ground. If you don't hook that up properly, you yeah. can burn something out. Absolutely. And yeah, so in a pinch, maybe I would do that, but none of these tools are super expensive. And I kind of found these when I was trying to diag this problem. And a lot of these are really cool. And almost none of them are automotive specific, but I didn't even know these existed. And it seemed as though when I started testing things, like nothing was working. So right. at first I started checking fuses, right? That's the easiest place to go. I checked this though and every fuse that would have to do with that seemed to be fine. And then I was thinking for a little bit, well wait, if all this stuff is on one circuit, if a USB port is only designed to provide half an amp, right? well, I mean a five amp or a seven and a half amp fuse is like obviously way too much protection. It could be something else on here. Like we gotta right. break this out a little bit more specifically. 
I put my hands on a USB load tester. This thing is super neat. It provides an artificial load. It just, you can, so you can actually t test what's coming through a USB port. Rather than just say, oh, this is charging, it lets you quantify the charging, right? You can see the voltage, right. the amperage, et cetera, et cetera. So if, because this is USB, we're gonna set this thing on five volts and then you, know, you can just change your amperage. There's literally a little potentiometer on there so you can crank it up. Super helpful. I thought this was really, really helpful. Um, it lets you put a true load on something. You don't have to go by the spec of whatever device it is that you have on there. You can actually, you know, see what you're doing. However, proceed with caution. Yes. Can you, you <laughs> can you explain why we need to do that? Yeah, it's really easy to increase the load past like the uh, jack or cables capability and just kind of smoke it out. You know, you can burn up the contacts or you can, you know, kill the fuse, which is something we're gonna talk about later on in this video. Yes, and Nick knows that because I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you buy one of these with great power comes great responsibility. Moving down the line, uh, Nick had suggested this is a Diag piece and I actually really like it. I'm gonna let you introduce this one, buddy. Yeah, I mean, it's just a USB thumb drive. Those things need power to be able to play music. So if you put an uh, MP3 file on it, you plug it in, if you get music, it means it's got power, it's got data. So uh, in a nutshell, it's working. How well it's working, discuss. Is debatable yes. for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think just about every car should be able to read an MP3 file. That yep. should be, yep. or at least recognize it. So yeah, that's a really good go, no-go gauge. But as Nick sort of alluded to there, you don't know exactly how much power is coming through. And that's where this meter comes in handy. So this tester will test both USB and USB-C ports. And it's kind of helpful because it'll let you see exactly how much voltage and amperage you're seeing on the power side coming through the port, which can be really helpful if you have an undercharging issue, which is actually a real thing. And kind of one we were discovering, we were yep. working with Christina's car. We'll get to that in just a moment. And there's some other stuff too that can prove helpful. I would call these more ancillary items, but we have some power ports over here, which, you know, we were kind of diagging two problems at once because this was sort of an integrated unit. So having a way to also check power coming through the cigarette ports helps because not everything is like the old cigarette ports, right, where they just would provide blind power. Now, sometimes they work a bit differently. Oh, and then down there, some cables, some adapters are going to be helpful, if not necessary, for diagnosing some of these options. And then we also have down there a really neat cable tester, that little red circuit board. So that thing's kind of interesting because it allows you to isolate different parts of the system. So up till now, we've talked about testing the USB port itself, but of course, there's other components, right? This system is going to be as weak as that weakest link. Now the cable tester might seem a little bit extraneous, right? Because the cable is not part of the car. However, you kind of have to test the cable too because that's what's moving the power out. We also found, I didn't realize this, but there are apparently power only cables as well as data only cables. And this will allow you to test the function of the cable to make sure that that cable is capable of moving both power and data as well. And then of course, once you get your tester involved too, you can actually quantify that using a load on there as well. So as we started kind of digging in, we realized we were gonna have to have to figure out what was going on. So we used Nick's sort of go, no-go gauge on the USB port. We could get music to play through that car. So we, we knew that the USB port was functional. So it seemed strange that she couldn't get a charge on her phone. And then from there, you know, we were looking into the power ports. Those both seemed to test out good too. So we were kind of scratching our heads for just a little bit. So we kind of ran through the gamut using each of these testers. We did hook up the load tester, dialed in a load to make sure that that thing was providing all the power it should. Now, Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about how much power should have been provided? Yeah, <laughs> sure thing. Uh, quick answer is not a lot if you're coming straight from a USB port that's uh, in your front of your dash. Most of those are using some of the original USB standards, which only provide for half an amp, 500 milliamps. They did bump it up later with about 900 milliamps but still not necessarily enough to keep your device, your phone, or whatever charging if you're using all the features, you have your screen on at max uh, brightness. Uh, you could still be depleting your charge. In newer cars, they do have faster charging ports in the back. They call them dedicated charging ports, and those will run at 2.1 or 2.4, right. even 3.6 amps, although I don't think I've seen 3.6 amp chargers in a car yet. Right. Yeah, so the rear seat chargers are kind of interesting too. So an easy solution you can give to your customer if they have a charging problem is just try running that charging cable to one of the back seats. And the reason there is that those back seat 
dedicated power chargers are often more inexpensive to buy at scale for the manufacturers than a combined data charge port that may still offer a slower charge. So you may find a slower charge and data port up near the front of the vehicle in order to communicate with the, the, you know, the infotainment center. However, for just dedicated charging, the rear seat is often your better bet. So helpful tip too, if you're on a car trip of your own. You know, Nick had kind of said early on in our testing process there, he said, you know, GPS uses, it burns a lot of, a lot of you know, a lot of energy. You have yep. the screen on um, most of the time. I don't think many people are just working off audio directions and that can really pull a lot of energy. Yep. Um, and depending on the shape of your phone, of course, you know, you, you, that may not be enough, right? I mean, we had talked a little bit about battery, battery health, right? Yeah, you know, if you, if your battery's starting to go, it just doesn't hold a charge as easily anymore. It takes more and more current to, to build up that charge. Right. So just for the nature of having a, maybe an older phone or a phone with a bad battery, uh, went through a lot of charging cycles, you could be plugging it into some of your front charging ports uh, on the dash and it's just not delivering enough power to keep your battery charged. Okay, so what do you do in the case where now this USB port tests good by all measures, right? We're getting right. data going through there. We can see a file. We obviously have power because we powered up a USB drive. What's the problem? Why, why won't this work? Well, one of the things you can do is you can check the color of the port. So the different USB standards had different port colors. So the first ones were white and then black, and those are generally the lower amperage ports. Uh, with USB 3, they moved to blue, and then from there they moved to a couple other non-standard colors that show up orange, teal, things like that. Anything that's not black or white is usually a higher amperage charge, but it still may not be enough. Right, and about how many amps does your average modern cell phone take to charge, say? Two, yeah. two point four amps, something like that. I think that's what most will easily accept. So right. a great takeaway there I, I got from this was if I see a black or a white USB port, it might not be up to snuff even in good health at keeping you know keeping electronic device you know charged right. up. I think that's super critical to remember. But in addition to that that charging, I know that there's a data component to that too, right? So I remember you telling me a little bit about the digital handshake. So depending on the, the actual integrated circuit used in there, there is oftentimes handshaking where the controller wants to talk to the phone to make sure there's actually a device plugged in. Right. And then from there, it'll set the charge. And some devices like Apple and whatnot can, can have dynamic charge rates based on that data flow back and forth. Right. So if you have, say, if you have a bad cable or you're dropping your connection somehow, the port may not recognize there's a device, uh, and then it may not supply charge, it may not supply data. Right. That was, I thought, one of the cool parts with the meter. I think we saw a phone with dynamic charging that would vary that charge rate, which I just thought was super cool. Another good point, too, is you know if some devices, depending on how they're programmed, if they don't see that handshake, they may revert to that half amp standard too. So even though your phone may want to charge at two and a half amps and you have a you know a cable that's you know able to handle all sorts of electrical power, if the you know if the electronics don't talk to each other, you may be relegated to that half amp right. too, which is all, also where that charger comes in too. You can test each part of the setup. That cable tester down there, you know, we also used to determine, hey, do we have data coming through? Do we have power on these? It's kind of nice to split those off because there are cables, that, as we discovered, that are some just data only and some just power only. And right. some are those cheap garbage gas station cables might <laughs> be telling you a fib about how good they really are. So in the case with Christina's car, we had an intermittent issue. You know, it came in, it didn't work. Um, let me got in there and started using the load tester and I think smoked it out. Several times. Several fact, times. Yes, broke it several um, times. And then it worked again. Can you show some light on that? And yeah. So the charge controllers and the integrated circuits uh, in a lot of USB controllers have what's called a polyfuse. Uh, and that's a, a crystalline polymer fuse. And as these fuses heat up, they essentially trip. So if there's high current or more current than they can withstand, right. they will trip. And what happens on the molecular level is that the polymer kind of melts. It kind of deforms and it expands and the conduction of the electrons through it breaks down a bit and the resistance skyrockets. Nice. And then it acts just like an open fuse. Now the bad side of this is just from the chemical properties, they right. can take hours, days, even weeks to reset so okay. that uh, it could be a while before you're able to plug a device in again. And that can lead like a tech like us to just condemn a port when it's really not a bad port. Right, you just had to wait for yeah. it to reset. That was a big takeaway for me too. I, it's very rare, of course, on a car that something is breaking and just waiting around for the car to fix itself. We all know that <laughs> never happens, but this truly is one of the times when that could occur. Jessica, help me understand though, why are they using this design, right? Like why, why not just protect it with a fuse and call it a day? 
Well, because of the nature of integrated circuits and circuit boards, you just don't want somebody messing around with it. Once you have somebody down at the circuit board level playing around, you could easily short something out, you could damage stuff, you can cause more damage than, than uh, just simply frying the particular port. You right. can cause further damage to the vehicle. Right. And it just doesn't make sense to have a fuse right there or somewhere else for just that part of the circuit. Right. Which Makes is sense. exactly why the spec for these is written such that they can't be human resettable, right? So this spec was written outside the automotive space, right? In the automotive space, we're accustomed to things, you know, the technician is gonna fix something. And the electronics world, apparently they do not want people like us mucking about <laughs> with stuff, which kind of makes a little bit of sense because, well, I did smoke that thing several times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in the end, I'm sure everybody's wondering, what was the issue with Christina's car? Excellent question. It took longer to get here than I thought it was gonna. So in the case of the bad USB port, I think what we had going on there was simply heavier draw than that USB port could provide, right? It's, it's trying to supply half an amp maximum, which sounds great, except that that phone wants, you know, two, two and a half amps, maybe depending on when right. it's charging. And, you know, she's got the screen fired up, she's got GPS, so it's constantly looking for a signal. You know, things basically, you know, it's not charging at idle, so to speak, right? right? You've got you've got heavier draw than you do charge. So even though there's a lightning bolt maybe that shows up, yeah, no, she was right, it's not charging. Yeah. Now in the case of the two power ports there off to the side, well, this was our victim, this thing right here. Uh, this is a standard USB charger. And originally I thought this thing was just fine, right? When you plugged it in, the red light came on, great, we got power there. But I didn't really check it too much more deeply than that. Um, but Nick did think to, and what he discovered was that little red charging light on this <laughs> gas station power port does receive power. However, it's not pulling power off of the, the hot side of the USB. So the light functioned just correctly. This is effectively a little LED light. The USB had no power whatsoever, but that little red light would definitely come on and lie to you and say you were good to go. Unfortunately, the meter was able to help us discover that. Another interesting thing too that Nick had pointed out that I kind of missed is if you look at this, there's a pretty good melty spot in there. And I'm not sure if that's related, but I would bet on it. Yep. So that was the, the culprit along with simply an older spec USB port. And it was a problem that we were able to fix and hopefully now you guys can fix as well if you have a little bit more information about how these ports work and what you should be looking at. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, swing on by Shop Press. We've got lots of other articles and videos that are tech focused for Dorman products. And for Nick and Jess, I'm Lemmy, we're out of here.